And Sean San Nicholas will read our gospel reading for which our sermon is based. Sean San Nicholas. Good morning, everybody. Good morning. <clears throat> this morning I'm going to be reading Matthew 9:35. 10, 8. Jesus went through all the towns and villages, teaching in their synagogues, proclaiming the good news of the kingdom and healing every disease and sickness. When he saw the crowds, he had compassion on them, because they were harassed and helpless, like sheep without a shepherd. Then he said to his disciples, The harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. Ask the Lord of the harvest, therefore, to send out workers into his, into his harvest field. Jesus called his twelve disciples to him and gave them authority to drive out impure spirits and to heal every disease and sickness. These are the names of the twelve apostles. First, Simon, who is called Peter, and his brother Andrew, James, son of Zebedee, and his brother John, Philip and Bartholomew, Thomas and Matthew the tax collector, James son of Alphaeus and Thaddeus, Simon the Zealot and Judas Iscariot who betrayed him. These twelve Jesus sent out with the following instructions. Do not go among the Gentiles or, any, or enter any town of Samaritans. Go rather to the lost sheep of Israel. As you go, proclaim this message. The kingdom of heaven has come near. Heal the sick, raise the dead, cleanse those who have leprosy, drive out demons. Freely you have received, freely give. Thank you, Sean. God's blessing on the reading. God's blessing on those who hear it. Today's message from Proclaim is all together now. You know, sometimes the desire to take all the credit means that we are not good collaborators. In preschool, we're told to share. And sometimes that's difficult because it's something we want and we don't want to share it. But I can tell you, no one was more qualified to take all the credit than Jesus. Yet he made his disciples collaborators, collaborators in the work of the kingdom. And he even called out the 12 apostles who would assume great responsibility for making choices as collaborators. If Jesus could share the credit with those ordinary people, Shouldn't we do the same? In the 1963 film, Lilies of the Field, and I know there are a few of you who weren't even born when Lilies of the Field came out. It was based on a novel of the same name by William Edward Barrett. I mean, this was a groundbreaking film because um, it won an Oscar for Sidney Poitier. He was the first African-American to win that coveted award as best actor. Now, I think Sidney was originally from Barbados, but he became an American citizen, so we claim him here in America. The story is set in the Arizona desert, and Poitier plays an itinerant um, laborer named Homer Smith. He pulls off the road to get some water for his uh, radiator. I mean, his car is all battered and in bad shape. And he discovers a group of impoverished 
nuns. They're refugees from the war-torn Europe, and they're now eking out a living from the dry soil of Arizona. Any of you been to Arizona? There's a lot of dry soil in Arizona. So Mother Superior believes that Homer Smith's accidental arrival is God's answer to her prayers for someone who will come and build them a chapel, a chapel of adobe bricks, and that's built on the ruins of an earlier failed attempt. Now Homer sees it differently. He has to be paid for some repairs he made around the uh, primitive convent, quoting Luke 10, 7, the laborer is worthy of his hire. But Mother Superior responds by quoting Matthew 6, 20, consider the lilies of the field. As the story progresses, Homer, a Baptist, ends up building their chapel and finding a part-time construction uh, job to help pay for uh, the chapel's materials. And like Mother Superior, he has a dream. His dream is that he wanted to be an architect. But he exhausts himself with crushing labor in the sun. A crucial scene in the movie comes when his dedication inspires many Hispanic day laborers in the region to donate materials and labor, which leads to a crisis for Homer. If he allows the others to help, will it still be his accomplishment? His pride causes him to quit temporarily. And soon he realizes his skills in design and supervision, coupled with the back-breaking labor of others, I mean, with that, I mean, he gladly shares and makes this un a unique triumph for both groups. And he makes it in a community accomplishment as well. I can imagine that's what it was like when they built this sanctuary in 1893. Because originally, there were Chinese laborers who were working in the quicksilver mines just south of here and east, who also did the back-breaking work of setting the stones once the masons had set the foundation. It became a community project where community members joined in. Community members donated money so that they could put our bell in the steeple in 1897. When the chapel is completed, Homer quietly drives off, becoming a figure of local legend while the new chapel becomes not only the home for the community's worship life, but also a launching pad for planned schools and hospitals as part of their growing ministry. Homer Smith struggled with the idea of working with collaborators. I mean, if anyone wants to accomplish anything without the help of collaborators, or could, it would have been Jesus. He was able to feed multitudes by simply blessing and breaking bread. When it came to healing, he didn't even need to be present, nor did he have to be told what people needed. This week's scripture passage begins with a short statement that encompasses one of the longest periods of time described in the Gospels. It may sound like a contradiction in terms, but it is not. Jesus speaks for three and a half.
half chapters in the Gospel of John following the Lord the Last Supper. From John 13, 17 to the end of chapter 17. The longest speech in the Gospels, but with words that can be spoken in a matter of minutes. Take time. Check it out. Again, John 13, 17 through chapter 17. Now compare that with the continuous dialogue Jesus engaged in with religious leaders during his final week preceding his crucifixion. Each of these encounters, no matter how wordy, are over in a few seconds of reading. But consider these simple words from our reading today and how quickly I speak them in this single verse. Then Jesus went about all the cities and villages, teaching in the synagogues, proclaiming the good news of the kingdom and curing every sickness and disease. Matthew the Evangelist is describing not just days or weeks, but describing months, the journeys between various cities and villages, the hours Jesus spent speaking, and the same for healing. This long period of time represents a success story. And there's no suggestion, as there are in other places, that Jesus failed in any way. The problem is, his deep felt compassion leads him to lament to his disciples that the work of the kingdom requires more collaborators, more laborers, more laborers to bring in the harvest, more laborers to awaken the world to God's love, to awaken the world to being compassionate to others, more laborers to live the love of God. I mean, this leads him to call the twelve, the twelve apostles. And in some ways, we think of twelve as being perfect. You know, the Jews or the Israelites were, were in two sections. Uh, basically, there was the Judah portion of them, and um, then there were the people of Israel. Sort of like in our own nation where there are people who are in one section or believe one thing and people in another section who believe another. In fact, had there been DNA tests available, they would no doubt have shown that all 12 tribes were represented in the populations of Judea and Galilee. The same with people of this world. If you go beyond or below that first layer of skin, we are all the same. Our hearts our livers, the things that make us who we are, our brains, our eyes. We are all children of God. Now uh, keep in mind, 12 is a very convenient number for the people who did not think in mathematical terms back then. They didn't think in terms of the base of 10 like we do. Zero that we use didn't um, exist back then. It would not have been incorporated into mathematics for over a thousand years. You didn't talk in terms of one's place or tens place or even a hundred place. Twelve was a great number. I mean, it was
was used in the bartering economy because you could divide it by six, by four, you can divide 12 by two. The apostles could be sent out in groups of various sizes. 12 as a number speaks not only to a completeness, but to the identities of small groups, similar to our dozen eggs, similar to a dozen donuts. It's easier, much easier to share. But if we're all sent out as collaborators of Christ to a suffering world in need of healing, teaching, and belonging, the nature of our collaboration is something that we must focus on. Who are we associating with? Who needs us to be that face of Christ? Jesus often referred to elements of daily life in his teachings, shepherds and sowers and day laborers and homemakers and lawyers and scholars, rich and poor. These are still part of our world today. But we may use terms like marketers, programmers, um, television broadcasters, virtual reality, and smartphones to express the same things Jesus expressed then. It's up to each of us to decide what's the best way to interpret Christ's teaching in 2020. We have intelligence, but do we have experience? Are we meant to share the compassion of Christ with others? Are we meant to be the helpers? You know, the name of the 12 apostles don't necessarily tell us about those collaborators, even though there is sort of a little definition of who they are. And they were very different, just as we as Christians are very different. We have different ways in which we've grown up. Some have grown up in the faith all their lives. Some are just coming to the faith. We don't expect everybody to know everything. There is no perfection, and it is not a requirement to be part of this Christian process. I can assure you perfection has not been a part of offering virtual Sunday services. But we have collaborators. I don't have to do this alone. I have people to help, to offer the message, to hear different voices, to know that each of us is on a different path to knowing God. And our job is to open that path for others, to collaborate with Christ, to collaborate with us here at the Middletown Methodist Church. I mean, we all have a part of the work of Jesus. So, I say, gratefully, next Sunday we can join together again here in our sanctuary. We'll still be doing virtual services, so if you're not feeling like you want to come back quite yet, if you don't, I encourage you to consider it though. Because not only do we have the sanitation stations, we have people who have cleaned this sanctuary top to bottom. We'll have masks here for you as well so that we can be all together to inspire each other in serving God.